Well, welcome on to Veil. We're so excited that you're here this weekend. Will you stand and worship with us?
Cause you stepped into my Egypt And you took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom Into the promised land Now I will not forget you, God How sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fear
And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. It is good to see you guys. You can grab a seat. And my name is Corey. I've got the privilege of serving on staff here as one of the pastors. It is good to have you guys in the room. You guys joining us online. It is great to be with you guys today. And we know that every weekend is somebody's first time with us here at Valence. So if you are new, welcome. We are so honored that you chose to spend part of your weekend here with us. And here's the thing. We would love to get to know you, but it's hard for us to do that if we don't know anything about you. And so I've got a small ask. Here's what I would love for you to do. In the seat in front of you, there's a card that says, My Next Step. If you could take a quick moment, fill that out, check that new here box, and before you leave today, bring that out to the info counter. We would love to meet you, put a gift in your hand, and just thank you for joining us today. If you're like, I don't feel like writing, or you know, I can't find a pen, or it doesn't work, or anything like that, we got you covered. You can use your phone. You can text the word NEXT to 309-777-0677. And what will happen is somebody from our team will reach out to you this week just to once again say thanks for joining us, see if you have any questions, or talk about how we can help get you connected here at Vail. But we're not done yet. Because when you text that number or you turn that card in, we do something else. We also make a one-time donation to a local nonprofit ministry partner in your honor. So just by being here, texting that number, filling out that card, you are already making a difference in somebody else's world. You may be wondering why we would do that. Well, one of our core values here at Vail is we give generously. So we believe that it is better to give than to receive, but also that giving is something God wants for you and not from you. And so if you would like to participate in giving here at Vail, there's several ways that you can do that. If you brought cash or check donations, you can put those in any of our drop boxes located on the walls at both exits or out in the lobby. But you also can get digitally as well. You can go to our website, veil.church. You can text the word Vail to 77977, or you can give using the free Vail Church app. And all of our digital ways are simple, they're safe, and they're secure, and they allow you to give a one-time gift or set up a recurring donation if you feel led to do that. And I want to let you know that it is through your generosity, church, that we're able to partner with organizations such as Convoy of Hope. And one thing that Convoy of Hope does is they respond in times of crisis, providing life supplying needs uh, that, that people have. And so right now, Convoy of Hope has supplies such as fresh water, hygiene kits, and bags of food that is en route to Hawaii to help those who are affected by the wildfires. And so it is through your generosity that we are able to provide these things for people and see how the gospel expands. So thank you for your generosity, and we would love to continue partnering with you in that. As we continue to get ready for our service today, 
You can open up your Veil Church app on your phone. You can get to the message notes section and follow along with the sermon we're gonna get to in just a few moments. You also can get ready for summer nights that is gonna be happening. You can go ahead and pre-order your food by texting the word menu to the number on the screen. And so get that going so your burger, your dog is ready when we get out of service today. You can get to the message notes section. Let's check out what's happening in Life of Veil by watching Veil News. Hey, Vail Church, my name is Sean Jensen and I'm excited and honored to serve as your new lead pastor. We're so glad you decided to make church a part of your weekend. Men, we've got just the event for you. On August 29th, come on out to Blow No Pizza Company for pizza, golf, and community. Guys, since you're coming, invite a friend, neighbor, coworker to join you. This event is open for all guys high school and up and it's only 20 bucks. You can sign up today by going to veil.church slash events. Back to School Bash is back and it will be bigger and better than ever. Kindergarten and fifth grade students are invited to join us the weekend of August 19th and 20th after each worship experience. There will be go-karts. Yeah, you heard that right, go-karts. A donut wall and inflatables. I can't wait for my daughters to experience the Back to School Bash. I love seeing them get excited for the new school year and get them energized for what's to come. Make sure you mark your calendars and don't miss Back to School Bash. Child Dedication Weekend is a special celebration for parents to thank God for the precious gift of their child, as well as committing themselves to maintaining a Christian home where God is honored at the center of their daily lives. Church, this is a weekend we come together as a church community to pray for these children and their spiritual development. If you're interested in dedicating your child, you can sign up on our website under the events. Now, let's get ready for today's message. Who was Jesus? He was a maverick, a perceived rebel with a cause, a rabbi against the grain of what a rabbi should be. He didn't act like people thought he should. He didn't associate himself with who people thought he should. He was for the down and for the out, the underdogs, the misfits. And it's not just who was Jesus, it's also who is Jesus. When he died on a cross for our sins, he rose again three days later. He defeated death. The one who was became the one who is. He's not just a past tense ideal, but a present tense life changer. The past tense inspiration became the present tense king. The past maverick became the present master. He's the way, the resurrection, and the life, the good shepherd. He's the light of the world, the true vine, and apart from him, we can do nothing. Jesus, and Jesus alone, is our true north. Well, good afternoon, Vail Church. And it is so good to be back with you. Some of you may not even remember, but I've, I've spoken here before. Uh, you did my book, Creatures of Habit. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, gosh. Thank you. But I don't know how long ago that was. That was a couple years ago, but um, I've since retired. And so I've been speaking around the country quite a bit since that time. I pastored, for those of you that don't know, I pastored at Northview Church uh, in the Carmel, Indianapolis area, which was one church in 15 different locations. And God just continues to bless that congregation and church. But uh, we retired at, at actually the first of the year, and we're having the time of our lives just speaking at different churches. And so I get the privilege to be able to be with you for the next three weeks to do this series on True North. And I'm excited, of course, uh, good friends with your former pastor, Ted Max, and I'm so excited for he and Amy and what God has for him in his next chapter. But let me tell you something, guys. God never shuts the door without opening another one. And none of this caught God by surprise. He knew exactly what he was doing. And so I'm so excited. Uh, I just met your new pastor, Sean, uh, out in the atrium, and I'm so excited about what lies ahead for you all here at Vail Church. Seriously, we're gonna 
Sandy and I are gonna get the opportunity to spend some time with them next Saturday night and to get to know them just a little bit more. But I really believe that God only has great things ahead in this next chapter for your church. Well, I, I wanna jump into the series, but I first wanted to reintroduce you to my wife, Sandy. She was with me last time, but I wanted you to... She always, she always lifts the... Yeah, anyway. You look good. Turn to somebody and say, you know, you look pretty good. Okay, that's enough. I hope that was your spouse. Well, let me pray, and I'm going to jump right into this. Father, I just thank and praise you for your faithfulness. You're an amazing God. And Lord, what an incredible opportunity it is to, to be able to be back in this, in this church, Vail Church. I thank you, Lord, for the way that you're using this congregation. And I pray, dear God, that there's only greater days that lie ahead. I pray that your continued favor and blessings would be upon them and that you'd give them opportunities they never even dreamed possible. Thanks, Lord, for their new pastor, Sean. I'm just praying that your blessings and favor would be upon him and that you'll just uh, be with him as he ramps things up and uh, moves his family and just starts this new chapter of his life. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, now that as we get into your word, that you'd open up our eyes and ears to see and hear all that you wanna do in our life. Thanks, God. In the name of Jesus, amen. So guys, as we said, we're gonna start a new series over the next three weeks that's called True North. So what, what do I mean by True North? When we talk about true north, what does it mean? Well, it's the direction that points directly towards the North Pole. It's also called the geodetic north, which is a fixed point on the Earth's globe. You can see that. It's a fixed point. We all know that, the North Pole. So how do we find true north? Well, I think some of you would quickly say, well, Steve, you need a compass. So I brought a compass. And if we were looking for true north on this compass, I believe it is, true north is right there. So if all of you got behind me, lined up behind me, and we walked straight according to this compass, my question to you is we, would we end up at the North Pole? How many of you believe that we would? Some of you say, this is a trick question. I know it is. <laughs> How many of you say, no, I don't think we would? How many of you say, I really don't care? <laughs> okay, most of you. Okay. Well, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. So what you have to understand is that some of you I know are saying, what, that doesn't even make any sense. If a compass is telling us that we, we would lead, we're leading it north, then how would we not end up at the North Pole? You see, while true north is a fixed point on the globe, magnetic north is the direction that a compass needle points as it aligns with the Earth's magnetic field. And what's interesting to me anyway is that the magnetic North Pole is not a fixed point. It's always shifting in response to the changes in the Earth's magnetic core. So magnetic north almost never, listen, it almost never aligns with true north. And the difference depends on where you find yourself standing on the Earth. For instance, if you're in Los Angeles, Los Angeles following magnetic north, you would miss true north by 12 degrees. If you were standing in New Zealand, and you followed magnetic north, you would miss true north by 20 degrees. You see, almost all compasses, I think you know this, but almost all compasses use a magnet. So they're gonna direct us towards magnetic north, not true north. Let me show you another example of what I'm talking about. Your iPhone, as you probably know, also has a compass on it. So if you took two iPhones, let's say, and you held them side by side, but one of those iPhones, you opened up and you went to the settings on your phone. We'll show you up here. You went to settings and then you go down to compass. This is the screen that'll come up on your iPhone. So if you take one of your iPhones, if you have two of them, you take one of them, they're set on uh, whatever it's set on, do the opposite. So one of them will be on magnetic, the other one turn on true north. 
And then if you hold those two phones side by side, they will not point in the same direction. I've tried it. They will not point in the same direction. You will see they will point in just a, bit, just a little bit different direction. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Man, this guy's smart. <laughs> oh, okay, that's, that's probably not what you're thinking. What you were probably thinking is, Steve, who cares? Who cares? I mean, what in the world does all of this have to do with Scripture? Listen, when you think about where your life is headed today, there is a parallel between what we're talking about here with True North and Magnetic North. When you think about where your life is headed today, I think all of us might agree that we live in a culture today where everyone's compass is pointed in different directions. It's like, isn't that true? I mean, when you think about your friends, when you think about your own family, everybody has different ideals. Everybody has different ideas. Everybody has different worldviews. They have different philosophies. They have different values. It seems like everybody's on a different page. And if you follow magnetic, if you follow the magnetic pull of our culture, please hear me on this, guys. If you follow the magnetic pull of our culture, you will never, you will never end up at true north. So my hope is that before we finish with this series, only three weeks, my hope is that you'll find true north. You say, yeah, but Steve, come on. I think you're being a little uh, overdramatic. You know, if we're going in the same direction, what difference does it make if we're just a, a few degrees off? What difference is it gonna make? Listen, friends, it matters more than you might think. For instance, if you are in an airplane and you're only one degree off, no big deal, right? You're only one degree off. Well, if you travel for an hour in that plane at one degree off, you'll see uh, you're one mile off. If you go for two hours, now you're two miles off. If you go for three hours, now you're three miles off. You see how it escalates. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but it just continues to grow. So you get the point. What if you're headed to the moon and you say, well, I'm only one degree off. I mean, come on, how in the world are we going to get that spaceship to stay completely on course? It's going to be off, isn't it? If you were only one degree off headed to the moon, by the time you arrived on the moon, you'd be 4,160 miles off course. Needless to say, you would completely miss the moon. In other words, guys, listen, in other words, guys, you would, you would find yourself at a destination you never intended to be. Now, for some of you, you were once headed true north. You were once headed to Jesus. Your focus was on him. But something along the way, I don't know, something along your path has caused you to get a little bit off course. Maybe it was politics. Maybe you once had a biblical worldview, but, but now you... you have kind of leaned more to a political worldview. Maybe it was racial issues. I don't know, maybe the whole pandemic, the whole COVID thing kind of got you off course. Maybe it was money worries. Maybe, it, maybe you've struggled a bit with your finances. Maybe it was relationship problems. Or maybe it was just an old habit that's kind of creeped back in your life. Guys, whatever it might have been, my encouragement is this. Jesus is the only way you will ever find true north. Please hear this. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are in life. I don't care what you believe. I'll promise you, Jesus is the only way you will ever find true north. That is true for every person on this planet because it's not about us. When you understand the purpose of life, it's not about us. It's all about him. And so you say, well, Steve, what's the question? It doesn't matter. He's the answer. Whatever it is you're struggling with, whatever it is you're going through. In fact, Jesus clearly defined that for us in 1 John chapter 14, verse 6, when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty clear. Jesus is saying, I am the way. I am the way to true north. I am the way to God. I am the truth. I don't just talk about truth or tell the truth. I am the very definition of what truth is. And I am the life, abundant life now and eternal life with God for all eternity. Now, in the book of John, we have seven I am statements that Jesus 
used to identify himself by. You would not think that's necessary, but it, it is. Oftentimes people say, well, you know, if, if I surveyed this room or even we went beyond and we surveyed the community and said, how many of you believe in Jesus? A big per percentage of the people would. If I asked everybody in this room, probably 99.9% .9 of you would say, yes, I, I believe Jesus. But if I ask you to describe him to me or talk to me about who he is, it might be completely different all around this room. And so it's very, very important that we're able to identify who is Jesus. There's a lot of confusion about that, and we need to be able to identify. And yet Jesus is extremely clear in Scripture on who he is. In fact, you find it in John. Look at this here. He gives us seven I am statements. This is who he is. He said, this is, this is me. This is my character. This is my nature. This is what I'm all about. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Now, we're going to look at three of these over the next few weeks. We're going to look at I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd, and I am the true vine. Again, guys, I hope you'll be here for this because I really do think that it'll, it'll be an eye-opener in some areas. Friends, it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 50 years or if you're just now considering the claims of Christ. I think it's important, please hear me, I think it's important that every one of us are able to answer this question. Please listen, this is a big deal. Who is Jesus and what are you gonna do with him? Who is Jesus and what are you gonna do with him? Because here's the thing, friends. One day, every one of us are gonna stand before God and we're gonna to have to answer that question. So it's better you know, the, know your, what your answer will be before you get there. Who is Jesus and what are you gonna do with him? Now, I wanna to start today with what I believe to be the most definitive and powerful statement Jesus ever made about himself. I think this is the, out of all three of them, this is the most important, this is huge. In John chapter 11, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Guys, why do you think COVID, why do you think the pandemic so paralyzed our world? I mean, I mean, my gosh, everything came to a halt. Businesses closed, churches closed. I mean, everything came to a halt. What, what is it that we were afraid of? I don't think it's because we were afraid to get sick. I mean, all of us get sick at times. We have a cold, we have the flu, whatever, we've been sick. No, I think, it's, I think it was the fear that someone I love or that someone that I care about or maybe even myself could die from this virus, from COVID. You see, guys, the fear of death, or let me say it differently, the desire to live is the strongest human emotion we have. Out of all the human emotions that instinctively that we have, the desire to live is absolutely the strongest. Now, uh, there are many of us, if I said, how many of you are not afraid to die? Many of you would raise your hands. I would raise my hands. I'm not, I'm not afraid of death. I'm just a little bit concerned about the trip there. You know what I'm saying? And so that's the unknown piece to all of us. That's the one that bothers us the most. Woody Allen once said, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I've often said, I'm not afraid of death. I'm just not ready to get on the bus. Listen, we can exercise and we can eat right. We can live right. We can refuse to take any kinds of risk. But as Bernard Shaw once said, he said, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people die. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? There's gonna be a day, guys hear me, there's gonna be a day when your body is gonna slump and you're gonna take that last breath and immediately, the, the scripture tells us immediately you will be in the presence of the Lord. I want you to listen to what Jesus says right after a close friend of his died. We see it, you know the story, I'm sure. In John chapter 11, verse one, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. We don't know what was wrong with Lazarus. We just know he was terribly sick. It was serious enough that his two sisters thought he's not gonna make it. He's going to die. 
Jesus had become very close friends to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so they knew we better reach out to Jesus. We better do something because his time on earth is very short. So they reach out to Jesus. They call on him for help. Look at it in verse three. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. So they're, again, they are very close with Jesus. They don't have to identify who it is. Jesus automatically knows who they're talking about, okay? This was someone he loved and he cared about. So he immediately knew who they meant. He immediately knew who they were talking about. So do you know what Jesus did when he heard about this? The minute Jesus hears about it, do you know what his response is? Do you know what he did? Nothing. He did nothing. I don't know, I don't know about you, but that is a passage that always seemed odd to me. It's just like, what? You're so close to them and you find out that your close friend Lazarus is near death and you don't respond, you don't go? Why why didn't you just stop what you're doing and immediately go to him? Guys, have you ever felt like your prayers were going unanswered? Have you ever felt like you cried out to God in desperation and you knew this was extremely important and something had to happen now and you're crying out for Jesus for help and nothing happens? It feels as if the ceiling is brass. It feels like your prayers are, are going up to the ceiling and bouncing back down. You see, guys, the story shows us that God's delays, this story is so good because it shows us that God's delays are not because he's ignoring you and not because he doesn't care about you. He just has a greater purpose. And I know that's hard to wrap our brain around, but stay with me. He just has a greater purpose that we might not be able to see, that we might not be able to understand. And he wants us to trust him. Listen, he He's always at work in the upper story. Have you, have you heard that terminology, the upper story and the lower story? The upper story and the lower story. I use that terminology all the time uh, at Northview. And what it basically means is the upper story is the invisible realm. That's where the Holy Spirit is at work. So whatever's happening, the, the scripture talks about it. Whatever's happening in the upper story is the invisible realm. That's where the Holy Spirit is at work, and it's not limited by time or space. So it, time is not an issue. Space is not an issue. He's everywhere all the time, right? We can't wrap our brains around it, but that's a fact. The lower story is the um, visible realm. That's where you and I exist. That's where we are right now, and it is limited by time or space. Meaning what? Meaning that I know there's something going on on the other side of that wall, but I have no idea because I'm limited to what I can see in this room. I'm limited by time or space. I'm limited by by my watch, by my time. So what we have to understand and trust, that's where faith comes in, is that we have to trust that God is always at work in areas that we can't see, that we don't understand, but we know he has our back. We know he has a purpose. We know he has a plan. We know that he loves us. And so we can completely trust him. Even though in the lower story, that's beyond our comprehension. Listen, the outcome to your prayers might not be what you prayed for. But God has not forgotten you. He is always, I promise you, his word is true. And I promise you, he makes it clear that he's always at work in your life. Now, naturally, Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to come and to heal their brother, right? I mean, that's what probably our prayer would have been. And if we could contact Jesus, that's what we would have done. And and when when we're praying for family members that are sick, that's what we're praying for. We want you to step in. We want you to heal them. But it didn't happen the way they wanted it to happen. Lazarus died. Why didn't Jesus answer their prayer? You know, the scripture tells us in Hebrews, it says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Again, it comes back to our fear of death. But for the believer, for the Christian, death is actually a graduation. For the believer, the Christian, it's actually a graduation into the presence of God for all eternity, not just for another limited time span, but forever to be in the presence of the Lord, free from all pain and tears, free from all earthly limitations of any type. What's hard is for those who are left behind. 
What's hard is for our family members that are left behind. Those who maybe refuse to follow Christ as their Savior and Lord. On the other hand, if we have family members that are Christians that are believers, then they have a hope that they'll see us again. If we die and go on to heaven, there's a hope. If I lose a friend or a family member that is a Christian, it's hard. I'm going to grieve, but I don't grieve as if one who has no hope. I grieve knowing that one day, I don't know when in the distant future, but one day I will spend all eternity with that person. And that gives me hope. So after Lazarus dies, Jesus then decides to go. It's been a couple days. We look at John eleven seventeen. 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Is that a big deal? It is a big deal. In Jewish culture, four days was very significant. They believed that after someone died, their spirit would hover over their dead body for four days. But after the fourth day, the spirit would leave permanently and there was absolutely no hope. So when Jesus shows up on the fourth day, well, I don't know how else to say it. Mary and Martha were ticked. They were angry. I mean, you know, I I may be ad-libbing a little bit here, but as I read the text, I can feel it. And I think you can feel it as well. They They are mad at Jesus and they're verbal about it. It's like, you're too late. There's nothing you can do now, Jesus. Have you ever been ticked at God? You know, sometimes we don't like to admit that, but it's okay. You know, God's big enough to handle it. Jesus was big enough to handle the anger of Mary and Martha, and he's big enough to handle your frustration and your anger as well. Maybe, just maybe, he didn't answer your prayers the way you wanted him to or when you wanted him to. Jesus, I have prayed for my marriage And now the divorce went through. My marriage is officially dead. It's day four. Or you've been praying for God to help you climb the corporate ladder. But today, they downsized you. They let you go. God, come on. It's day four. It's over. You missed your window of opportunity. If Jesus would have just showed up when I asked him to, this all might not have happened. That's what Martha said. So as angry as you would be, that's how angry they are. Look at it in John 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. I don't think she said that peacefully. I think she was mad. I think she was angry. It's also what Mary said. Mary comes along later, says basically the same thing. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Come on, haven't you ever felt that way? There have been so many times in my life I have. God, if you'd have just done what I asked in the past, this would have never happened. Listen to what Jesus says to Martha. Verse 23, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. I think Martha's extremely frustrated at this point with that answer. You know, it's like, I don't think Martha looked at Jesus when he said that. I don't think she said, oh, thank you. I think she's still ticked. And I think she's thinking to herself, seriously? Really? Really? Verse 24. Yes, Martha said. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. She thinks Jesus is talking about a future event. She says, yeah, I know in the future things are going to be great, Jesus. I get that. I know I'll see Lazarus again, but Jesus, I'm hurting right now. I'm in pain right now. It's the way you or I might feel if we suffered a loss and someone said something to try and make us feel better. Don't we all try to do that? I mean, guys, we want to comfort people. We want to be there for people. And so we'll, we'll say things with a, with a right heart. You know, well, you know, you're, you're going to see him again in heaven or you know, I'm sorry you lost a child, but, you know, you can have more kids in the future. Or, you know, I'm sorry you lost your job, but you'll find another job. Maybe it'll be a better job than what you had. You know, I, I, I understand what we're trying to do. We're trying to make people feel better. We're trying to be kind to them. But right now, listen, right now, you're not worried about the future. You're simply looking for hope today. You're simply looking for hope right now. Well, let's see how Jesus responds to her frustration. In verse 25, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, Martha? You see, he's not asking if she believes he could have showed up in the past or he could do something in the future. No, he's asking, do you believe that I can do something in your life right now? Martha, do you believe that I can do something to help you today? He's trying to get her to see that real life can be found in Jesus today. Listen, guys, there's no other way to a relationship with God except through Jesus. They're just not. We've all sinned against God. The scripture makes that clear. Every one of us have failed God. The Bible says we deserve to die for the sins that are in our life. But Jesus gets up from his seat in heaven and he comes down to this earth and he lives as a man. And yet it says in several places, it says he never sinned. He then willingly goes to the cross and he dies in our place so that we can be forgiven. And three days later, he rises from the grave to conquer death. And what I want you to understand, my friends, is that the resurrection is the key. Listen, it's the key to what separates Christ from all others who have claimed to be God. There are many. There are Confucius and all the other that claim to be God throughout the years. But there is one difference between Jesus and all the others that have ever said they were God. And he, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Let let, let me simplify this. No resurrection, no Christianity. No resurrection, no Christianity. Throughout the years, I've many times I've heard people say, you know, they keep trying to disprove the resurrection. But I, I have firm faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if someday they prove that he didn't really rise from the grave, it's not going to affect my faith. I'm still going to believe in him. I wouldn't. I absolutely wouldn't. Because Christianity is all based on the resurrection. No resurrection, no Christianity. We have to understand that, guys, the resurrection is the single greatest miracle the world will ever know. It demonstrates Christ's finished work of redemption, and it reminds us that his power over death makes a way for us to spend all eternity with him in heaven. But let me go back to our story with Martha. Jesus is telling her that even though the outer shell dies, the person who believes in Christ will never die. He says, so Martha, do you believe this? Martha, is your hope in me? Do you trust me with those things you can't see with your eyes that are going on in the upper story, Martha? Do you trust me? Do you believe me? You see, the Bible gives us a definition of what faith is, and that's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is. It's defining it. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It's talking about the upper story confidence and assurance about what we don't see, what's going on in the spirit realm. Faith is certain of what God is doing in the upper story. Jesus sees Mary and the mourners weeping and he sees the tomb and it says what? You know it, he wept. Jesus wept. Now, I find that fascinating because you you do realize that the Bible did not have, it was not divided into chapters or verses until Uh, hundreds of years ago, several hundred years ago, way after the Bible was written. They're just letters that are written. And then they took them and they divided them up into chapters and then they divided them up into verses. And it's interesting to me that they come to this one and they made a verse out of two words. Jesus wept. Why did they do that? Because everybody saw the significance of those two words and they knew it needed to be singled out. 
And I, I, I read that and I think, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Why in the world would Jesus cry? He knows that he's getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead. Nobody else knows that, but he knows that. Because I think, my friends, listen to me, I think you're seeing the heart of our God for those that are hurting and feeling hopeless. I think we have a heavenly father who hurts when he sees us hurt. Well, Jesus then stands in front of the tomb. Friends, listen, every tomb begs the question, where are your eyes fixed? Where are your eyes fixed? Are your eyes fixed on Jesus and eternal things? Or are your eyes fixed on the things of this world? Oftentimes, explain it like this. It's like, uh, I can be focused on Jesus, but then all of a sudden the cares of this world come around and these four fingers get in my face and what happens? Immediately my focus leaves Jesus and I start focusing on my four fingers. That's what happens oftentimes in life is that we're focused on Jesus, but the cares of this world get in the way and our focus changes. We have to be determined we have to be determined that we're always going to focus on him no matter what. Because I'm telling you, the things of this world are wasting away. Well, Jesus stands at the tomb in verse 39, and it says, he says, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. You see, they didn't embalm back then, and it was a warm climate, so bodies would decay very quickly. So again, the text is just making this very clear to all of us. It wants us to make sure, the writer wants us to know that Lazarus is dead, okay? Verse 40, he goes on, and Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. At this point, I'm telling you, you know, you know, in those days, they hired professional mourners and they would weep loudly and they would beat themselves and they would make a big scene. I'll promise you at this point, it all stopped. It all got very, very quiet, silence in anticipation of what maybe could happen. Verse 41. Well, I'll just go back to that. So then Jesus looked up to heaven. This is the part I want you to see here. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I think many times we just want to read over that, but I don't want you to read over. Father, thank you for hearing me. Why is that significant? I think it's important. This is my opinion. Do you remember those two days when it didn't feel like Jesus did anything? When he hears about Lazarus and he does nothing. And you think, come on, what are you doing? I believe it was during those two days that Jesus was praying for Lazarus. You see, Jesus' first response was always prayer, always to get the mind of the Lord before he ever did anything. Prayer also kept his focus on what God was doing. Prayer always kept his focus on the upper story, the visible realm. Verse 43, it says, Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave cloths, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Can you imagine this scene? I mean, it's like, it's not like he walks out of the tomb. I mean, he's hopping out of the tomb. He's all bound up. They had wrapped him up like a, like a mummy and put all these incense and stuff on him. And so he comes out hopping out. You can imagine what a scene this had to be. After four days, a dead man comes back from the grave. This is such a cool story. And yet at the same time, guys, I hope you know this is not the ultimate resurrection story. At this point in time, death had not yet been defeated. Jesus had not risen from the grave. In fact, we know that Lazarus, hey, Lazarus would one day die again. Bummer. Friends, the ultimate resurrection happens a little while later when Jesus comes out of the tomb on that third day. You see, guys, what I think you know, but I just want to say it again, is that the Easter story is not just a one-day event. You know, we celebrate on Easter Sunday, but the Easter story is a three-day story. Day one is Friday. That was the day they tried him. That was the day they judged him. That was the day they whipped him and beat him and mocked him. That was the day they spit in his face and pulled out his beard. That was the day they hung him on a wooden cross to die and laid him at a tomb to rot away. That was day one. 
Day two was completely different. It was a day of silence. Nothing happened. And because nothing happened, they all quickly began to lose hope because they thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah. They thought Jesus was going to be the next king. And now he's dead. Now he's gone. But then there's day three. And on day three, he rose from the grave and he conquered death. Sunday is by far the most, it's the most death-defying, grave-defeating, hope-inspiring event in the history of mankind. So I hope this helps you to understand who Jesus is. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he said, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. He says, do you believe this? So you see, my friends, Jesus is our true north. You and I, we were created by God to be in relationship with him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So it doesn't matter how good of a person you are or how generous you are or even how religious you are. If you're headed in any other direction than true north, you're gonna be so greatly disappointed. You know, oftentimes when I talk to people and they they don't understand the Bible. They'll say, Steve, I try to read the Bible and I just, it doesn't make complete sense to me. And I said, you know, it's really not as difficult as we make it out to be. There is a thread that runs through scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And that thread is relationship. The whole Bible is about relationship, about our relationship with Jesus and about our relationship with one another. That's why when they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And oh, by the way, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what's important. And that's what the entire word of God is about. We start out in Genesis and, and God creates the earth and all that's in it. And he creates man and he puts him in the garden. He then sees he's lonely. He gives him, uh, takes a rib and gives him woman. And then he puts the two of them in the garden. And he says, this is all yours. I want you to enjoy it all. Be blessed and happy. Be in relationship with me and one another. I want you to enjoy it. Oh, by the way, there's a tree over here. I don't want you to eat of the tree. And what do they do? We don't even get to the third chapter of Genesis and they eat of the tree. And so sin comes into the world. And all of a sudden, this perfect relationship that God designed for us to have is separated. And now there's a chasm. There's a gulf between us. And so then we go through the rest of the Bible and we see constantly mankind trying to build a bridge back to God. And so they'll, maybe if I give enough money, that'll work, but it didn't work. Maybe if I attend church enough, that'll work. It didn't work. Maybe if I'm a good enough person, that'll get me back to God, but it didn't work. Jesus said, again, I've, I've read it to you, but he said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So what happens? Jesus gets up from his seat in heaven he comes to this earth as that baby in a manger. That's the Christmas story, right? And then the Bible says he lives without sin. Several times it tells us that. It's a big deal because someone had to pay for our sin, but it had to be a sinless sacrifice. And Jesus goes to the cross and he dies, not for his sins. He never sinned. He goes to the cross and he dies for you and for me, for the sins that we've committed. And then he rose three days later from the grave. But because of that victory over sin and death, he steps into that chasm. He steps into that gulf to build a bridge, to take the hand of God and to take your hand and my hand and to bring us back together again. But it's a free gift. Scripture says, but as many as received him, to them he gives the right to become sons and daughters of God, even to those that believe on his name. It's a free gift from God. He's saying, I'll t just take my hand. I want to give you salvation. I want to give you forgiveness. Again, we saw it a few minutes ago. All of us have sinned. We've all messed up. And the wages of sin, Romans says the wages of sin is death. You and I, we deserve to die. But Jesus paid the price so that we could be forgiven and declared not guilty. Jesus died to be our true north. And if you've never accepted him, I want to give you that opportunity today. I'm going to ask if you would, just everyone bow your head with me, with every head bowed and every eye closed just for a minute. With every head bowed and every eye closed. 
If you've never made Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord of your life, I want to give you that opportunity today. If, you, if Jesus is not your true north, I want to give you that opportunity today. What I'm going to ask you to do, no one's looking around. It's just between you and me and God. But how many of you would just raise a hand and say, Steve, I'm just not sure, and I want to be sure that I'm on my way to heaven. I want to be sure that Jesus is my true north. Would you pray for me? And I want you just to raise your hand right where it's at. No one's looking around. Yes. Anyone else? You're not sure. Make sure I see you because it's dark. Yes. Once I point to you, you can put it down. Yes. Who else? You're not absolutely sure, but you want to be sure today. Anyone else? Yes, right in the front. Anyone else? Then with every head bowed and every eye closed, there were three of you that raised your hands, and I'm gonna just ask those three people to look at me. I don't wanna do anything in the world to embarrass you, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray a prayer out loud. And if you meant business with God, I'm gonna ask you just to repeat it to yourself silently. And as you do, I promise you, not only will he forgive you, but he'll come into your life as Savior and Lord. So as I pray out loud, just repeat it silently. Dear Jesus, I know I failed you. I know I've sinned against you. I ask you, God, to forgive me for all the sin and to come into my life as my Savior and as my Lord. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. And now, Lord, I commit the rest of my life to loving you and serving you. In Jesus' name. Well, if you are here today and you made that first time decision to follow Jesus with your life, we believe that that is the best decision that you can make. And as a church, we want to celebrate that with you. So let's give it up for that. Here at Vail, we believe that nobody goes on this journey alone. And so if you made that decision today, we want to partner with you in that. And so here's what I want to ask. In the seat in front of you, there's that card that you can fill that out, check the decision that you've made, whether that is deciding to follow Jesus for the first time or something else, and turn that in at the info counter, or you can text the word next to the number on the screen. And what's going to happen is we will reach out to you this week to celebrate your next step and also talk about how we can partner with you in that. But if you're here today and you're like, you know, I've been following Jesus, Jesus for a while, uh, we believe that everybody's got a next step. So no matter where you are in your faith journey, there is always a next step that we can take because we are never done in growing in our relationship with him. And so you also can check that box. You can share your decision. It could be talking about baptism. It could be learning about joining a small group or talking about how you can start serving here at Vail on a consistent basis. Whatever your next step is, we wanna partner with you in that. So fill out that card, bring that to the info counter or text that number and we will be in contact to celebrate with you and go on this journey together. Now today we get to do something that is a little different from our normal. Today we get to continue worshiping, not just through song, but also through communion. And communion is a moment where we get to remember and celebrate what Jesus did for us. We get to celebrate the fact that in spite of our sin, even though we are the ones who have made mistakes, Jesus took the punishment for us when he went to the cross in our place. And when he gave up his bread, his uh, body, we remember that by the bread that we take. When he gave up his blood, we remember that by the juice that we take. And in this moment, we have an opportunity to just have a simple conversation with God, to thank him for what he did so that we could have a restored relationship with him. And so around this room, we've got tables in the back. We've got communion up here on the sides of the stage. And as we go into this next song of worship, this next moment where we get to spend a moment with God, I want to invite you to, when you are ready, go to one of the tables, grab communion, and come back, worship with us through song and through taking the bread and the juice. And so would you stand with me today and respond in worship? Thousand tongues to live to one crowd. 
church. Let's lift up a shout of praise. Wow, what a week, and I hope that you had an amazing time here at Vail. Just a couple things before you head out, though, just a couple things. First off, if you or anyone you know needs prayer, our prayer team will be down front. Who is glad that our church believes in prayer? I'm so glad that we pray with each other. So come on down front. Also, if you didn't get time to take communion, those stations are still out. But listen, tonight is the last night of summer nights, and there's inflatables out there. There's grilled food options. There is a foam party who we like to call Foam Daddy. I'm not sure what that means, but your kids are going to love it. I'm going to be out there. My family's going to be out there. There's frozen treats out there. We'd love to have you join us. Go out there. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Thank you.